Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about psychology in video games. Because a good designer thinks about how people think. I think about what you think. And I know what you're thinking right now. And yes, I dress myself. I picked this shirt out myself because it's got popsicles on it. Some of you may have missed where I talked about the fact that I have a minor in psychology. Weirdly, when I wanted to get computer science at University of Virginia, it's part of the engineering program. And if you pick computer science as your major, they require you to pick a minor. And it says related minor. I would say most of the people I knew in computer science took management information systems as their minor, which was in the business school, which made me realize it could be anywhere. You don't have to pick like electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. You can pick anything you want. So I picked psychology. And the reason for that was there were no artificial intelligence classes in the computer science department at University of Virginia when I was there in the 80s. The only psychology, uh, the only AI class offered was a graduate program in psychology. So my plan, and this is, I, I made this plan in my second year. My plan was minor in psychology, apply to grad school in my fourth year, hopefully get an early, and then my last semester at UVA, approach whoever's teaching the graduate level AI class and say, hey, I'm going to grad school. I've been minor in psychology. I'm, a, I'm about to get my bachelor's in computer science and I would love to be in your class, even if I have to audit it. Well, what really cool, I did get in early at University of California, Irvine, and the teacher who was teaching the AI class, the graduate AI class in psychology, actually thought I'd be a good fit. So I didn't, I, I couldn't, I didn't just audit it. She let me be in the class and it was a great class. So I think that's probably one of the most used psychology classes that I took, except maybe abnormal psych, but you kind of got to be in the game industry to know why abnormal psych was useful. But I digress. I want to talk about how psychology helps when you're doing game design. Now, I know I mentioned, I forget what video it was. I mentioned that inexperienced producers think you can schedule creativity. I mean, they literally go, okay, so you're going to have a new hook for the game next week, or you're going to have uh, inventory redesigned next week. As if you can go, oh yeah, I'm going to have three brilliant ideas before lunch and then maybe one on my coffee break in the afternoon. I don't know where they think ideas come from, but they literally make schedules that have you being creative on a timetable. I know why they need it. I, I've done the same thing, but guess what? You may not be creative on that timetable. And similarly, I've run into inexperienced designers that think that game design is all about math. They they make spreadsheets that show weapon damage versus damage resistance versus level versus uh, you know expected player statistics attribute values and skill values and ranges. And that's fine. That's really fine to do. And if you're really going for strict realism in your game, it's probably necessary to do. But it's really more important to think about how your players think. And the reason for this is you can make the best design in the world, but if it goes against how players want to play or how they think, it can be bad. I'm going to talk about three cases I can think of, uh, and I kind of just put them in the order. One is something I thought of years ago. One is something that happened just a few years ago, but not as far. And then one is something that happened this year. Let's talk about case one. Um, I was at a conference almost 10 years ago now where I talked about how I wished I had made the Fallout character creation screen differently. So here's the character creation screen. The problem I have with this, it is not immediately obvious what you're supposed to do. Yes, there are buttons, but they're all different. There are buttons, up and down buttons near the attributes, and then there's buttons next to all the traits, and there's buttons over by the skills. And what's weird about them is the attribute buttons make it clear that you can go up and down 
but the traits and skills are just selected. And when you get over to the skills, that's when you realize you're not putting any points in skills, you're tagging them to make them your primary skill. Those will be skills that get an extra bonus at the beginning of the game. These are just things you kind of have to know. And since this screen just pops up and it's all right there, all at the same time, you just kind of have to know, oh, I gotta do all these different things. Now, when I mentioned it, a lot of people said they like this screen because as you're adjusting your attributes, you see your skills change. As you pick different traits, you, you might see some skills change or your attributes change, so you can go back and forth to them. And I agree, that's a great thing about this screen. But players, new players especially, it's a little daunting. And even existing players sometimes forget to do things like change their age. Um, it's really common that people forget to change their name. I think we had a pop-up that kind of prevented you from like, hey, you sure you want to continue with your name being name? What would have been a lot better is you get to the screen and maybe it highlights. You want to pick your name? Now you want to pick your age? Now you want to pick your gender? Hey, now let's pick some attributes. Don't worry, you can come back and, and change these. Now, let, now why don't you pick two traits? You don't have to pick any if you don't want, but you can pick up to two. Now let's tag two skills. Oh, great, now we're done. And, and at that point, when you're done, it can say, okay, all of the things you just did are open to you. You can go back to any of them right now and change them. But going through an order makes it very easy for casual players to learn what's going on and have it explained to them at each stage. These are what attributes do. These are what traits do, and you don't have to pick any. And these are what tagging a skill means, and you get to tag two skills right away. Great. But experienced players... Based on what we watched people play, they would forget to do some things. And that one pa that pass of going through everything in order would have helped even experienced players not forget to do something. And since at the end it opens up everything anyway, you can just go click, 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 and then do every anything you want. You can click through everything in order and then just play with it all day long. So I think that would have worked really well for experienced and casual players. When I mentioned it, I, I made a reference to... The view from a mountain is just as nice if you climb the mountain, you know, or, you know, you rock climb your way up the side of the mountain or you drive up and, and drive up to the vista and just look. It's the exact same view. So, and the point I was trying to make is the character creator works and makes the same characters whether we make it easier or whether we make it harder. A lot of people like to say, well, the journey, the journey is half the experience. And I didn't understand that because it's like when they put the car road going up, they probably didn't change the cliff so you can still rock climb up there if you want to. But this becomes one of those things of people going, well, I wouldn't rock climb if the if the trail was there. Which the reason I'm bringing this up is it's I want to draw attention to both points there. One, I think it would be better to redesign the character creator in Fallout because of the psychology of how people used it. Watching people use it, they missed things. Even experienced people miss things. And casual players were a little daunted by the complexity at the beginning. But then me talking about, hey, just changing it to be easier won't ruin your experience. And some people are like, yes, it will. Isn't that interesting? The character creator is the exact same functionality. But for some people, making it easier changes that experience for them. Psychology. That's my point. Whether you argue whether or not I should have changed the character creator, my point about paying attention to how people think is the important part. It's proven either way. The one I really like talking about, Case 2, is from an MMO I played. And you may have played too. It was a real popular MMO. I'm not going to name names. I named Fallout because I made it. Everybody else can try to figure out what I'm talking about. But there was a really popular MMO that did an, an experience point penalty if your character didn't sleep eight hours every 24. People hated that. They hate it. Even though there were inns everywhere, there you could always find beds that you could rent and sleep. Didn't matter. So they changed it. So, hey, you got a bonus if you did sleep. Now, behind the scenes, they just adjusted the XP. So it was the same level as it was before. Meaning, if you didn't sleep and you got a penalty... Now sleeping gave you a bonus. The adjustments were the same. They just moved the XP curve down. So if you didn't if you didn't have the bonus, you were getting what the penalty was. And the bonus set you back to normal. It was the exact 
same thing mathematically, but wildly different psychology. And to watch people argue against those two things was really interesting for me because I was just a player of that game. And to watch the, the game base argue over that change that was identical mathematically, but radically different in how it felt was very eye-opening to me because it was interesting to watch what I considered rational people argue about their feelings mattering in a part of the game that was purely numerical. Which kind of brings me to the third one. This is a case of two games coming out almost at the same time this year. One of them wasn't so well reviewed or received. And one of the complaints people made was that when you were in town, NPCs could block your movement. So if you ran into an NPC, you'd run into them and you'd have to move around them to get around. Okay, that seems to be a valid complaint. Maybe maybe if you run into an NPC, they should step back a little bit, or maybe you should be able to pass through an NPC, just not come to rest in the same spot. Maybe. But another game came out at almost the same time. I think they came up, they came out weeks apart. That second game, super well reviewed. People are saying this is gonna be the best game this year. Exact same problem. When you were in town, people blocked you and you couldn't get past them. Exactly the same. I was curious. I looked for reviews that mentioned it. I looked for people complaining about that on forums. Not a single one did. In fact, if you watched my video on foot sliding, you remember I saw the same thing, that when Diablo came out, they were had feet sliding all over the place and no one cared. Not a single review back then mentioned it and nothing on the forums mentioned it. This was the same thing, but in 2025, nobody cared about NPCs blocking your movement in town in the game they liked, but in the game they didn't like, it was frequently mentioned, which made me go, huh, if you make a good game, or a game that's well-reviewed, I should say. Because, by the way, I don't think there's such a thing as a good game. Same way I don't think there's such a thing as a bad game. There's just a good game for you and a bad game for you. And watch my video on bad games if you don't believe me. But if a game is reviewing well, many people, including the reviewers, not just players, but the reviewers, will ignore little problems in it. They just, they don't care. They don't even mention it. They don't bring it up and go, yeah, this is a problem, but it, it doesn't really affect your enjoyment of the game make a bad game, and by that, make a game that's not reviewing that well, oh my God, the same people will complain about all those little things that exist in the good one. And they don't even see the problem. They don't see that as hypocrisy. They don't see that as magical thinking or whatever because it's completely subjective. The psychology of video games is not the mathematics of video games. People will like what they like and hate what they hate, even if those things reverse on different games that are in the same genre. Because good games and bad games are subjective and so are what people like in them. So I don't know how to give anybody constructive feedback on this. If you're a game designer waiting for me to like lay out, okay, here's exactly how you handle that. All I can say is, first of all, good luck. And second, don't forget psychology when you're designing a game. If you think you can do it all with math, you are going to make mistakes. Try to think about how people approach games, how you can present something so that it would have been disliked if it was a sleep penalty, but somehow loved if it's a sleep bonus. Same thing, presented differently, voila. Think about that when you're putting your game together because I think a lot of, I see a lot of games make the mistake of presenting something that's perfectly fine and valid in a way that makes players balk at it. And I think I think we can all do better. I look at some of my old games and I wish I had done better. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about.